happening? Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Roger Gilbert from Milling and Grain Magazine in the Rongo Rongo Live video studio. It's a great pleasure today for me to have in the studio the Executive Director of the International Grains Council. The International Grains Council is based here in London. Uh, the Executive Director is Arno Petit and Arno has been with the Grains Council since February 2018, just over two years. Uh, it, as I say, it's based here in London and it's an independent analysis of grains, oilseeds, rice and pulses markets uh, for its member governments to promote international trade in grains. It also provides information to non-governmental subscribers. The IGC provides an important international platform for discussion between policymakers and the private sector. It also serves as the Secretariat for the Food Assistance Committee, helping to facilitate the networking uh, within the donor community to improve the efficiency of food assistance. But back to Mr. Petty. He's uh, from 2005 to 2017, he worked for the European Farmers and Agri Cooperative Union Copa Kojika as Director of Co Commodities and Trade. He was also a member of the Executive Committee for the European Technology Platform Plants for the Future between 2009 and 17, and is a member of the ex Experts Group of EU and US Trade Negotiations uh, at the European Commission up until 2017. Uh, prior to 2005, he served as the policy advisor for European affairs at the National Chamber of Agriculture in Paris and deputy member of the European Economic and Social Committee. He holds an MA in Agricultural Economics for the, from the International Center for Advanced Mediterranean Ag Ag Agronomic Studies in Montpellier, France. Uh, you wonder why I'm going to such detail to introduce our speaker. But it's important as a background because uh, Arno is, is looking at how we're going to be providing grains or the, the grain market as we go forward towards 2050 and that ever present thing on our mind of, of 9.5 billion people by 2050. So today I'd like to focus primarily on the impact of uh, COVID and what that might mean for the grain sector over the next five years. But we will also touch on a couple of other issues about sustainability, the environment, and also hopefully a little bit on pulses. But with no, fur no further delay, I'd like now to introduce uh, Arno. Uh, Arno, uh, good morning and welcome. Good day to, to you, Roger. Thank you very much for your nice uh, introduction. Yeah, it's a bit extensive, but I think you're a very influential person in the whole grain sector, and particularly uh, with the, the analytical data that you will have uh, within your organization, which will help the milling industry in particular, and the feed industry, uh, to actually identify where, where our industry goes over the next period. But the, the thing that's impacting us most, of course, is COVID. And I'm very interested to know what your view is about the next period, you know, whether the short term or short to medium term, uh, possibly five years. So uh, can I can I ask you to sort of like uh, review that for us, please? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the team uh, and our economists work on a five years projection for the grains and where we are looking for. And I think maybe we have to keep in mind two main ideas about the milling sector. Uh, first of all, the consumption trend will continue to be uh, tight, uh, continue to increase, and maybe more than the past last five years, which is something uh, interesting to look at. During the pandemic, for example, we have seen the consumption of wheat-based products still re relevant in Asia. We would expect the shift to uh, rise, but indeed the, the wheat-based product continue to be very uh, dynamic. And we know also that Africa uh, will be a region where the growth population will be will continue to increase tremendously. So we have here two big drivers for the consumption. The first part of the the point we have to bear in mind, and the second point is on wheat, and particularly on milling wheat. Um, we have not necessarily a lot of uh, stocks uh, uh, for the main exporters. So that means the market still remain very exposed to some disruptions. Could be climate event, logistics, 
And that's something also we have to look in the next five years, how the main exporters uh, will be able to replenish the, the stocks in order to give some, uh, I would say, buffer uh, to stabilize the market. Yeah. So, so do you think that uh, COVID, while not directly impacting uh, the production of grain or the growing of grain, has actually had an impact on, say, harvesting and the movement of grain and making sure it's in the right place at the right time? Has that been happening in the in the sector? I would say it's more um, the after COVID, where we see some potential disruption on transportations and on trade policies. Uh, during the COVID, the, the first and second wave of COVID-19 crisis, uh, product supply worked very well, and even we have been able to see a record harvest. So it's not it's not a matter of uh, harvesting; the supply work well. The question is more about transportation, and the maritime uh, transportation system has been disrupted uh, with uh, the containers as uh, transportation. Then on, on grains, particularly on grain sectors, there have been some new measures to, uh, to cope with COVID-19 uh, restrictions, which have limited the flow of uh, commodities. And the second thing is about trade policies. So we have seen some resurgence of uh, pro protectionism yeah. or limitation of exports, I, I would say. And uh, the second point is um, due to COVID, all administrative procedure has been slower in some importing countries. Have been slow, is slowing in some, in some importing countries, and we have seen digitization of trade moving on. For example, in Algeria, implementing recognition of digital signature for imports has been some step forward. Uh, in Kenya, in Morocco, so we could see in different countries and maybe important countries now starting to uh, uh, to um, I would say to implement this digitization. Yeah. So with your connection to governments, you know, in my introduction, you know, I outlined how the IGC fits into with governments and uh, private subscribers. But uh, with your influence or uh, connection with governments, is, is this bringing about a more cohesive approach to grain supply, given that the disruption has a, a real impact if we if we don't get it right? It's just not a commercial operation. Mm -hmm. I would say, in terms of supply, uh, to be to be fair to the main exporters, we have a lot of information, and there is a good coordination of information. Right. The question is more uh, what's happened on the demand side, and what we have seen from the begin beginning of this marketing year is when there is a shift from the demand side, buying earlier, uh, changing of originations, then we. I see some tension on the market. Should I, I remind that in, if you look at the global balance sheet of wheat, we are not missing about wheat, but we know the price how it is today. So it's more a readjustment, reorganization of the global system mm. with some frequency, mm. where we see today some uh, high prices rather than a, a lack of supply. Mm. And, and how do you see this playing out over the next five years? Do you? I think for the next five years, uh, we have two major issues to talk uh, and to really to improve. It's a question of productivity, because on the wheat uh, sector, we have not so much new area for cropping. So, meaning if we want to produce more or supply to improve uh, the increased demand, uh, we need to increase productivity. Mm -hmm. And there, I would say for governments, it's to look about the, the policies are putting in place relating to productivity and, and the farm level. Mm -hmm. The second point is about trade. Uh, as I said, uh, wheat or wheat-based product consumption uh, moving to traditional area, let's say Europe, North Africa, and developing to Asian region or to Africa, trade uh, policy and trade facilitation will be more and more relevant in the future. And that's something really we try to work we, uh, with our members uh, and within IGC. We are working on digitization of trade to have a better understanding of whom mm -hmm. is doing what. Uh, that's yeah. the first point. Uh, we had some discussions about the new building techniques and trade. Uh, I remember one year ago with Canada uh, hosting a, an event on this. So we try really to open the, the dialogue on some sensitive matter for, for governments, but at minimum, if we can have governments talking, exchanging each other the point of view, that's really the first steps that IGC can provide in this debate. Oh.
That's excellent. And and where does the environment, you know, we all talk about sustainability, environmental issues. Where, where does that fit into the IGC's thinking when, when we say we need greater yields or greater production? Um, I would say we are really at the initial stage, not because we don't take care about sustainability, but because there is, a, there is not yet a global approach or a global uh, problem, mechanism. To, I would say to report about the carbon footprint mm. of the world. Uh, we have seen several initiatives uh, across the world, some uh, research institutes, some governments even trying to implement some uh, carbon footprint. And I think now the, the question is for the future, can we have uh, a harmonized approach? Yeah. And in that way, maybe as IGC having a supply, uh, better view the supply side that we, can, we could work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, what we would try to do that definitively, what we are trying to monitor is the cost of transportation. It seems the maritime transportation is under the, the target for the moment about mitigation measures. And we have really to look about the potential impact on the cost of trade. Uh, just to, to tell you that on, on soybean, transportation can represent till 17% of the total cost of trade. So we are not talking about a, a minor part oh. of the trade. Right. Uh, it, it it can go between eight to twelve percent. Wow, that's significant. That's something we need still to look at because it could have in the future some impact. And I'm thinking particularly for the importing country where it's very relevant to them and they have no alternatives uh, to for from domestic market. Mm. Well, that's a that's a sobering thought, but it, it it does cost so much in that basically an administration uh, uh, role of, of grain supply. Um, we, I spoke uh, or referenced uh, a growing world population and obviously the, the figure of 9.5 billion in 2050 is getting ever closer. Uh, we seem to be okay. At, I, I guess at the moment you mentioned that there's uh, uh, restrictions on, or, or shortage uh, on supply at the moment or possibly coming up. Um, but how do you see, for instance, other grains uh, than, than wheat? Uh, possibly uh, uh, oil seeds or even uh, uh, protein crops uh, developing? Um, in terms of diversity, you are right that we see, um, first of all, I would, I would mention rice, because rice is really uh, relevant and really reliable on demographic trend. So and we have seen in Africa the consumption of rice going up. So that's something to, to look at. And I would say then is the, the new uh, commerce, if I may say so, uh, is pulses. Definitively, yeah. we have seen pulses go, going up in terms of global trade. Just to give you an equivalent, it is the same volumes as the rapeseed canola we are trading globally speaking, 17 right. million, between 16 to 17 million tons. So it's, it's now it's, we cannot say it is a minor product uh, in, the, in the global system, yeah. the global food system. Uh, and particularly for trade. And what we, we feel is there is some different trend behind the demand of pulses. Um, in, uh, in some countries, it is very vital for diversity and to mm -hmm. about food security. Uh, talking, for example, of India, uh, remember, remembering last year, the Indian government gave a special incentivize and uh, bringing uh, pulses in to say incentivize for consumption. And when for developed country, we see uh, policies, as you mentioned uh, earlier, the question of um, alternatives to, uh, to animal protein. And it is why there is a, a trend of this. And the question is more now um, about um, the market share of these uh, policies or meat, uh, meat alternative products. Mm. Like, they really replace till the end of a, till a major part, take a major part, I would say, of this, of this market. Well, it's not yet clear, I would say. We, we have definitively a, a clear demand from the younger generation about this type of product, but I would say from the other side of the society, are they ready to uh, adopt this new product? It's not yet there. So I, yeah. I think we still need five years to have a better understanding of how the pulses can really be a replacement to animal protein. Mm. Uh, you know, as a magazine, we serve both uh, animal feed manufacturers and the milling of grains uh, for flour. Uh, so um, uh, we're not looking to replace uh, animal protein, but I think uh, what I think the magazine is taking a stand on is supplementing 
uh, animal protein. It's, it's obvious we can't produce the volumes of animal protein that the that the human race would need uh, by 2050. And it's it's almost like the automotive industry, isn't it? That we've got to take an interest in an alternative uh, system, a uh, fueling system. And uh, they, they have turned from uh, fossil fuels to batteries, uh, but a transitional period. And I think maybe the milling industry has to has to look at this as well. And and it's good to hear that, you know, there, there is demand or greater supply of these pulses coming through. Um, exactly. And I would just add that the grain sector or pulses, I think we agree to be in mind that we are talking about a complex value chain. I fully agree with your views. That, and that's an interest, interesting part, to, I would say, to be involved in IGC works that we are not just talking about supply or just about milling, meaning mm -hmm. food, but we are talking about feed, we are talking about biofuels, we are talking about industrial usage. So we have very so many different sectors where the grains uh, globally, uh, including pulses, are feeding, and that's really is a very important and very interesting side of, of the work. Mm. Well, thank you very much. That's a great note to finish on. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today and uh, good luck in the future. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you, Anna. Have a nice day. Bye for now.